This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Skillshare, home to over 20,000 classes that could teach you a new life skill. In 1962, the United States Air Force was working furiously to develop an ejection system for pilots of the new Convair B-58 Hustler, the first jet bomber capable of Mach 2 flight. Bailing out at the speeds and altitudes the B-58 was designed for with conventional ejection seats of that era would have resulted at best in severe injury. Wind blast would likely rip your helmet and air supply off, the force of air would violently contort your limbs, with the explosive thrust of the ejection seat compressing your spine. And if all that didn't kill you, you may just freeze to death with external temperatures dipping as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius. And so the Stanley Aviation Company and Convair began a partnership to develop a fully enclosed escape capsule, which would fold shut before ejection and shelter the crewmen from the environment. But they didn't start testing this new concept on humans. The conditions were simply too hostile to risk a human on. The United States Air Force strapped a drugged up black bear called Yogi into a capsule and launched it at 35,000 feet at supersonic speeds. So how the hell did the world of aviation come to the point of needing to fire live black bears at supersonic speeds? Ejection seats were not always necessary in flight. At the relatively slow speeds of World War I and early World War II era planes, pilots could simply unstrap their restraints and jump overboard, like this German pilot being pursued by an RAF Tempest. But as the war progressed and jet propulsion technology advanced, British intelligence began receiving reports of German pilots being fired into the sky from defeated German jets. As usual, the Germans were well ahead of the competition in experimenting with the new technology, and the medical branch of the Luftwaffe was busy testing the physical limits of the human body to withstand G-forces. The designers of these devices had a difficult balancing act to coordinate. It was essential that the ejection provided enough acceleration for the pilot to safely clear the aircraft, while not accelerating them so fast that they would suffer injury. The first thing these designers needed to consider was how to power a device like this. They needed a way of storing potential energy that could be released rapidly in order to achieve the necessary acceleration in an emergency situation. Early designs simply called the pilot to manually release the canopy before triggering a compressed spring that would hopefully launch the pilot clear of the plane like some sort of wily e. coyote scene. This had some obvious inherent flaws. The springs did not possess the necessary potential energy to launch the weight of the pilot and seat upwards to safety, and requiring the pilot to manually release the canopy in an emergency situation was incredibly dangerous. As Douglas Davy discovered to his demise in 1944, during a test flight of the British prototyped twin-engine jet fighter, the Meteor. While performing a high-speed test, the aircraft lost one of its engines, sending it into an uncontrollable spin due to the differential thrust. At this time, Britain had not put serious consideration into escape mechanisms, and Davy was forced to open the canopy manually, which snapped shut, severing his arm. He was then either thrown out of the plane by the G-forces of the hurtling aircraft, or somehow managed to haul himself out, only to be critically injured by the aircraft's tailplane. This gruesome event highlighted to the British the need to develop ejection mechanisms, and with the end of the war coming, they would have plenty of German engineering to gain inspiration from. The Germans were racing ahead of the competition thanks to the huge amount of resources the Germans poured into experimental aircraft. By definition, these aircraft were unpredictable, and so the Germans also led the way in developing escape mechanisms. Helping save talented test pilots like Helmut Schenk, who was the first man in history to use an ejection seat, in an emergency situation, while testing the Heinkel HE-280 jet fighter. This seat did not use springs to power the ejection, but compressed air. An important improvement in energy storage, but required a significant amount of additional mechanisms and heavy parts to operate, like valves and pressurized air tanks. Despite the relatively cumbersome design of these ejection seats, by the end of the war it is reported that up to 60 Luftwaffe airmen had used these devices to escape their aircraft, and every experimental aircraft that Germans tested came equipped with an ejection seat. After the war, the Allies took over as the forerunners of ejection seat design, most notably by an Irish engineer, James Martin, who founded the Martin Baker Company alongside Captain Valentine Baker. They conducted their own tests of human endurance using this tripod launcher, another Irishman, Bernard Lynch, being the brave human guinea pig. They used an explosive cartridge to power the launch, instead of compressed air, and gradually upped the explosive power. With explosive upward trajectories like this, injury becomes much more likely if the pilot does not remain upright in his seat, a difficult task when under such immense G-forces. 
And so, Martin Baker cleverly built the trigger into a retractable head cover, which restrained the pilot's head in an upright position and protected it from wind blast. While revolutionary in its design, this ejection seat was incredibly simple compared to modern ejection seats. Every step of the process was manual except for the deployment of the drogue chute, which was triggered when a 15 foot wire attached to the firing mechanism and the cockpit floor reached the end of its line on ejection. The pilot still needed to jettison the canopy manually, pull the face curtain trigger, wait as the drogue chute decelerated and stabilized his fall, then unbuckle his belts and jump clear of the seat to deploy his own parachute. An impossible task if the pilot was knocked unconscious during the ejection sequence. Martin Baker won a contract with the RAF for all future aircraft to be fitted with this first generation seat and it saved its first life in 1949 when Joe Lancaster was testing the Armstrong Whitsworth AW-52, an experimental flying wing aircraft which entered an uncontrollable pitch oscillation due to the aerodynamic flutter of its elevons. Lancaster escaped and survived to tell the story, but there was plenty of work left to do. Lancaster was lucky as the problem was encountered at relatively high altitude leaving him plenty of time to deploy his parachute. But most problems occur during takeoff and landing. And so the next vital step in ejection seat design was developing a zero zero ejection seat, a seat capable of saving the pilot's life at zero velocity and zero altitude. Here, we are beginning to strike the limit of human endurance. To safely evacuate an aircraft at an altitude this low would require significant sustained acceleration to ensure clearance of a crash and an explosion and provide enough height to safely deploy a parachute. With tolerances this tight, we first need to automate more steps. By the 1960s, both Martin Baker and their American counterpart, Weber, were developing these zero zero seats. By this time, Weber's seats had saved over 500 lives and had been fitted in aircraft like the F-106 and the Gemini space capsule. The F-106 served in the United States Air Force for over 40 years and during that time was fitted with three different ejection seats, the interim seat, the supersonic rotational B seat and finally the 00 Rocat, each showing the gradual change in design ethos to what would eventually become the modern day standard design template. The interim seat was highly automated with a carefully choreographed belay of mechanical triggers like an advanced Rude Goldberg machine all starting with the pilot pulling these ejection handles, triggering an explosive initiator to fire which would begin a chain reaction of events through the hot gas emanating from its fixed volume chamber. This hot gas would flow through ballistic hoses to other firing pins in propellant powered actuators. The pressure of the gas would remove the firing pins, allowing the actuators to fire and unlatch the canopy and forcefully remove it from the aircraft. As the canopy cleared the aircraft, it would pull a lanyard which would trigger the explosive cartridge that would lift the seat clear of the plane. As the seat travelled up the rails, it would impact another trigger, firing a final time-delayed initiator, which would activate the drogue chute and release the seat buckles. The pilot would then either freefall or, if they had attached their zero-delay lanyard, would have their parachute deployed automatically as they fell free of the seat. This carefully timed sequence was a massive improvement to the manual steps of old, but it was missing two vital things. It was not capable of supersonic ejections or zero zero ejections. Initially, pilots pushed for supersonic capabilities, and so one of the most intricate and fascinating ejection seats in history, the B seat, was developed. This seat was designed to raise and rotate into the airstream, where the bottom of the seat would protect the crew from the air blast and act as an aerodynamic surface to provide lift raising the seat away from the aircraft. At this speed, the seats need extra lift to ensure they will clear the plane on time, and to help with that goal, rocket motors would fire to lift the seat to safety. The seat had two telescoping booms that helped stop the seat from rolling violently on ejection. This was an ingenious design but absurdly complicated with over 30 pyrotechnic devices from initiators, explosive bolts and wire cutters. This complexity led to a number of fatal ejections, and with mounting statistical evidence that supersonic ejections were much less likely than a slow and low ejection, a replacement was requested. And thus, the zero zero seat was developed, using the interim seat as a base, adding rocket motors to provide the necessary height to clear the plane after the initial ejection, and adding an explosively deployed parachute to ensure it opened quickly. Unlike the escape capsule of the B-58, this system was not tested with a bear, it was tested by a lunatic by the name of Jim Hall. Jim Hall is quoted saying, I've been kicked in the ass harder than that. This may well have been the source of the liar liar pants on fire phrase. 
And this 00 design has become the template for all ejection seats since, with Martin Baker becoming the world leading manufacturer, adding incremental improvements over the past 60 years, adding sensors and flight computers, along with vectoring nozzles for the rockets to ensure the optimum trajectory of the seat, even with the plane rolled upside down. Incremental improvement like this over the years leads to a vastly better product, and you can make your own incremental improvements by learning new skills. These days you can teach yourself pretty much any skill online and Skillshare is a fantastic place to do it, with professional and understandable classes that follow a clear learning curve. You can dive in and start learning how to do the work you love, from creative skills like animation and illustration to financial skills like this intro to stocks by my friends at Business Casual. A premium membership begins around $10 a month for unlimited access to all courses, but the first 1,000 people to sign up with this link will get their first two months for free. So ask yourself right now, what project have you been dreaming of completing but you aren't sure if you have the skills to do it? Why not start right now and sign up to Skillshare using the link below to get your first two months for free. You have nothing to lose and a valuable life skill to gain. As usual, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Twitter, Facebook, Discord server, subreddit and Instagram pages are below.